Hey everyone, it's Chris and Lisa from Been There, Got Out. Uh, we're back with another of our weekly uh, Q&A sessions, Been There, Got Out Q&A on Facebook Live. And if you don't know who we are, I'm sure you do, but if you don't know who we are, uh, Lisa and I have Been There, Got Out. We offer hope, guidance, and community to people suffering in or struggling to get out of relationships with narcissists and other toxic personality types so that they can find the strength they need to get their sanity back. Um, and what we do during the week is we collect questions uh, from our community. Lisa spends a ton of time on Instagram. I'm on Quora, plus things that come in via email and all the different ways to get in touch with us. We're, uh, we're pretty easy to reach. Um, and we like to answer them here in these live sessions. I'll also be checking uh, the, the questions uh, tab in our Facebook Live. So if you're here live, uh, you can type a question right in that panel. And we'll probably check it right at the end. So um, so go ahead and, and type any questions you have in there. So with that, um, this is this is week two of our uh, of our COVID series. Um, <laughs> I was uh, I, I unfortunately made it almost almost a year into this crazy quarantine and uh, my family came down with with COVID um, and it hit me um, really hard. Um, I've been out of it for about 10 days or so. Finally, the last couple of days starting to feel better. So, <coughs> so glad we could, we could do this, uh, without missing a beat. So with that, <coughs> um, Lisa, the first one is one that, uh, I, you know, I don't hear a lot of new terms anymore, uh, cause we've been at this quite a while, but you got a question that uh, is a really short question, but I have no clue and I can't wait to hear how you answer it. So the question is, what is trickle truth? Yes, this is this is fairly new to me too, and I love learning new terms. And when when uh, this came in and I posted about it, people were like, "Oh, there's just so many. There's just so many terms." So trickle truth, we actually just posted about it, like I said in our Instagram feed. And according to Urban Dictionary, trickle truth is when someone gives out minor details of something that happened and they still manage to hide the full story. And in this Instagram post, and I'll talk about it here in a little more detail, I mentioned how trickle truth in a large part contributed to my own complex PTSD. So I was you know, married to a narcissist and together with him for nearly 20 years. And there was a point in the marriage where, you know, in those last couple of years where I discovered some things and so my ex started confessing some of what he had done. And it literally felt like Pandora's box opened. And every single weekend, really, every single weekend for about three months or so, some new horror would come out. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So again, we had been together for about two decades. We had two kids together. And I just started discovering um, what was happening, you know, what, what actually existed behind the mask that he had worn for all that time. I um, did not have a very um, full of conflict relationship with the narcissist I was married to. We didn't fight very often. I actually thought, and I've said this several times, I thought he was my best friend. And I started discovering that he had a double life. So it was just staggering to discover more and more truths that would come out little by little. And the problem was that every time I'd find something out, he'd say, okay, now you know everything. Like, that's it. That's all I have. And then a week later, there would be another thing. And the way that gold truth affects your brain, or at least it affected my brain in terms of complex PTSD, is that... In your brain, there's a protective sheath called the amygdala. And when it keeps getting bombarded with new information that's upsetting, the sheath starts to wear down physically. And so in my case, and this is what happens with people with complex PTSD, where it's not just one event that's that's so upsetting, but it's several things, it, it wears down. And so I had really like no protection because it got worn down so much that I felt like I was living in a constant state of panic, like a constant state of um, fight or flight. And my intuition became completely messed up and it felt like it, it was never gonna get better, but 
luckily um, the amygdala can grow back. You know, once I stop bracing myself for the next awful thing, um, you know, it started to get better. But I feel like from from what happened with that trickle truth, dealing with somebody who behaved that way in, in a long-term relationship, it, it really did affect me. And Chris knows, and I've been told by other people as well, that I can get in a cycle of what they call awfulizing, like where I just start worrying that the worst thing is going to happen. And I think it's because I'm used to that from all that time in that marriage. Um, and I have to keep talking myself out of it. So trickle truth can really, at least for me, cause a lot of damage. That makes perfect sense now hearing you explain it. Yeah. And it's really encouraging. I was, um, you know, I, I hadn't read any of your notes on it or anything like that. So when you talk about the amygdala healing, that, that's what I was thinking about right before you started talking about that, because uh, you'll see um, there's a question later where I get into that, like, <gasps> response when you see you have a message from them or a message in your case a lot the message from the court system and how you get this like panicked yeah initial reaction it's because that physically that sheath in your brain is worn down and the fact that it can heal that's how people like get over the these the ptsd right yeah it's ptsd so you yeah. want to read the next one because i'm going to go on for a while this time okay all right so what are some of the excuses when you catch a narcissist in a lie yeah, that, oh boy, they have a deep and varied bag of tricks for these situations. And the funny thing is, is you know, it's it's often not hard to catch a narcissist in a lie, um, you know, especially as a relationship goes on and into the later stages, because they do it with such ease and regularity, and and at least they perceive themselves as having just complete impunity, and they just get careless. Um, they they don't even grasp the concept of, of of accountability or consequences for their actions and they just you know they're just blindly focused on achieving whatever the purpose is right in front of them and then just moving on right so i mean you just catch them um when you catch them just in a bald face line you have the proof right in front you know they there's a whole bunch of different things they could do and <clears throat> the first one is just deny, deny, deny. Um, they distort reality. They claim whatever evidence you present is simply wrong. They'll undermine the credibility of whatever sources you're citing. You know, oh, Joe is a, lies all the time, or everyone knows he's, you know, he's a troublemaker, whatever. <coughs> um, they'll simply make up a set of facts that has nothing to do with reality. And they'll just, they'll just double down on their lies with, with even more. And, um, and, you know, all of these, I'm going to say this about all of these, um, that uh, that was very common in my relationship. They'll also, um, they'll triangulate, right? They'll bring in some other poor sap who's, the, who's under their influence to back up their nonsense, right? Um, they'll obfuscate. They'll smudge facts, distort the issue. They got kind of squishy. Um, and, and make the issue way more complex. Like it's black and white. I caught you. You said this. It was a lie. No. Well, that's one way to look at it. You know, the, the, and then they'll just talk and talk. And there's a term um, word salad. Um, when when narcissists, they just run at the mouth till you're um, you even rant until you're just so spun around. The, like the conversation gets so far removed from the original point that it's impossible to refocus and get back to, yeah, but you said this and it's not true, right? Um, they'll deflect, they'll make it all your fault. You caused the problem to begin with. You made them do it. They had um, they had no choice. You know, you left them with no choice. You left them with no choice. Um, they'll rationalize. They didn't wanna hurt you. They lied to protect you. Are you so ungrateful for how well they treat you that you're attacking them over something done out of kindness? Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, they'll attack. I know you're smiling. You can probably. I know it's so, so familiar. Every one of them. Um, and then they'll attack, right? If, when they really get cornered, you corner a narcissist. It's like a like a wolverine. You know, they're nasty uh, when when they're cornered. And uh, they might say something like, "How dare you make such a big deal out of something like this meaningless slip?" <laughs> um, you're so petty 
Um, you caused all the problems in my life and you're focused on this. Let's look at your numerous shortcomings, Mr. and Mrs. Picky. You know, you're an abusive partner after all, right? And your focus on this stupid little thing is just more abuse behavior, abusive behavior on your part. And my ex did all of this stuff with um, astonishing regularity um, and just got bolder as it went on, you know, as the relationship got into the later years, it just got more and more ridiculous. And even after we split, <clears throat> but there's, um, there's also, you know, there's, there's predictability to it also. And once I understood what was going on, um, and, and that narcissists do this, like she still tries to just, just say the most outrageous things. Um, and unfortunately I can't go fully no contact because we have kids together, but the, the part that makes it so much easier now is I just see through the lies. I don't have any effects of like gaslighting or any of that stuff. Um, and I can just, and I don't even usually call her on it. Cause what's the point? I just ignore her or whatever, as long as I know the truth, it's okay. So yeah, I, I'm like, okay, I think you really covered it, Chris. <laughs> what can I say? But I did start thinking about what I could say. Um, and that is that, you know, through those two decades, my ex lied throughout the entire relationship. And one of the things he did, which was very effective, and I didn't question it, was he painted himself as this really good person and this really honorable person. And so how can you question someone who's so honorable? Um, and the irony is that a very close friend of mine from college told me how he thought it was really funny that he, he and my ex used to talk about politicians and people in the news a lot. And he pointed out that my ex, that for a large amount of their conversations, my ex would, would talk about how, you know, some of these people were so bad and so immoral. And yet, the ex was the worst of them all, you know? So here he is like talking about other people, like he's like holier than thou, but of course he wasn't. Um, and I also started thinking about, and I've mentioned this before in other places, but uh, you know, towards the end of my marriage, I questioned my ex, like why he lied all the time. I had such a hard time understanding how somebody could could lie like that. I mean, he had a complete double life. And so he, I think he actually answered me honestly because he said that lying is easier than telling the truth. It was it was better for him to just to just lie. And I used to ask um, you know, how he could do such things and what he thought was gonna happen. Like, you know, he always seemed shocked by the consequences. And so I would be like, well, well, what did you think I was going to say? Or what did you think I was going to do? And again, another honest response from him was, I never thought you'd find out. He said that he compartmentalized everything. So, you know, he had this double life or triple life where he would, he would do these terrible things and put it in a box. And then he would come home to me and the kids and, and behave and, and paint himself and see himself as this wonderful husband and wonderful father it was like he was responsible for this other stuff he did and it i really had a hard time coming to grips with that and i think that a lot of people do they just can't fathom how somebody could could lead a double life and it is very very common for people like this to have a double existence yeah <clears throat> All, right. All right. So, so the, speaking of that, do you want me to ask the next question or you want to ask it? No, you, you're going to answer it first. So I'll, I'll ask this one. Okay. So um, is this a form of gaslighting from a narcissist? <clears throat> and this is a quote, what somebody, a, a perceived narcissist would have said. I think you are cheating, not me. I should check up on you to see if you're with someone because I know I'm not. Oh, you should have read that differently. Chris, you said, I think you are the one who is the cheater. <laughs> Um, so this comes up all the time and it is so strange and it is really, really common for a narcissist or a toxic person to gaslight you and claim that you're the one that's cheating when indeed it is them who is the cheater. And it's a form of projection, which is probably one of the most common manipulative techniques that I've, that I've experienced that I just think is bizarre because they're accusing you of something that you know they're doing 
and you're defending yourself when you haven't done it and they have. So I know that um, in my own experience, you know, towards the end of our marriage, my ex insisted that, you know, we should try to save the marriage and go to couples counseling. And I've talked at length about what a waste of time, money and energy that was. Um, and how in my domestic violence certification classes, the, one of the first things they said is that couple counts, couples counseling is, is not ever a good idea when you're dealing with a toxic person. So anyway, but we did go th- to couples counseling. I didn't realize that it was a waste of everything. Um, and he managed to manipulate me and the therapist for years. We had multiple couples counselors. Um, And one of the freakiest things I remember he said was the the therapist asked us what we valued most in the relationship. We had been dealing with his infidelity. And he said that what he wanted more than anything from me in our relationship, brace yourself, was loyalty, okay? Now, I had never cheated on him even after he cheated, well, I found out he cheated the entire, the entire marriage. But so here he is telling this counselor and me that he values loyalty, like he, it matters so much to him. And in the meantime, he was still cheating and he was still lying. Yet he was claiming that loyalty mattered most to him. (laughs) That's crazy. Absolutely crazy. You know, um, that's the, the 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 first thing I thought of when I saw this question was it's not gaslighting, it's projection, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and projection was the very first trait I noticed a decade before I knew anything about narcissism. I just noticed this this quality that my ex had um, very really early in our relationship, and I remember having <laughs> a conversation with her out on our uh, back deck where she said, you know. What I can't stand about this person, I don't remember who she was talking about, is that he'll take his own worst qualities and put them on you as if you have those qualities. And I was, I, I didn't know the word for it. I didn't know what project, but I, I knew she did that. And I just stood there like, oh my God, like, do you see like the double layer of irony in there? Like, not only is she accusing someone else of projecting, but the, or, or not only is she accusing someone else of um, having this trait, but it's the trait that she herself has. You, you yep. know, it's like it's like layers of it. And I, I just was dumbfounded by that. And I'm glad now to have the vocabulary to be able to, to talk about it. But my, um, my experience was was kind of similar, you know, over 14 years with my ex, um, that she would often say to me, you know, uh, that she thought I was cheating. And she'd say, of course, you're cheating. All men cheat. And I never did. I, you know, I'm like incredibly loyal. That's like, I'm like a puppy dog. I always joke with you about that. Yeah. Um, and I learned after the fact that it was, it was um, her, you know, she had had um, serial extramarital affairs. Um, I'm sure there are plenty I don't know about because um, they're such, um, you know, habitual cheaters. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know about the, the specific situation um, that this person is in who asked the question. But, you know, I would say to anyone just generally, if you're suspicious that your partner is cheating and you've started down this path of, are they potentially a narcissist? There's, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire usually like, you know, it's a, don't be naive. And and there's probably some merit to your concerns. Yep. (laughs) Okay, next question. Yeah, you do. I'll ask. What's the difference between narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder? Sure. So <clears throat> I think there's there's kind of two answers um, to this question. And the short and sweet one is that there is no difference, right? Narcissism is narcissistic personality disorder. But the second sort of more nuanced answer um, relates to the common usage of the word narcissism or narcissist. And I think that, um, you know, most people who haven't had a reason, and if if you're one of them, you're lucky, uh, haven't had a reason to learn about MPD, they'll use the term narcissist, narcissistic rather, as a synonym for like extremely egotistical, right? Somebody has a big ego, oh, they're narcissistic. Um, They'll use those interchangeably. 
Um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that narcissism is actually a personality disorder. It's called a, technically what's called a cluster B personality disorder in something called the DSM, which is a, a manual, it's, you know, this thick that um, psych, uh, mental health professionals use to categorize different types of um, mental illnesses. Um, and I knew nothing. I didn't know DSM, what's that? Um, you know, before I started down this path of learning why my life was so chaotic and problematic um, and had to deal with all the, the stuff that sprung forth from that. Um, <clears throat> and I used to, you know, I used to throw around that term narcissism to describe people with big, big egos too. So I guess, you know, the difference is when someone uses the term narcissistic personality disorder, that kind of tells you, right, that they're at least aware of the, the fact that it's a clinical definition and they mean what they're saying in, in that kind of way. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking um, that we had a similar question last week regarding BPP or BPD, borderline personality disorder. Um, but I think for Chris and I, we, we really have to move away from labels. We're not qualified to make any kinds of diagnosis, especially from getting a, you know, a question from someone that we don't know even if we did, we're not, even if we knew you, we were not qualified. Again, um, our main goal for you is to look at the behaviors and help you work through what's going on in your own relationship. Like we said, so you can find the strength to get your sanity back, get some clarity and to hopefully teach you about healthy love so that you can move on with your life. All right. So, um, all right, the next one, and uh, let's see. The next one is, why do I still miss my ex-narcissist girlfriend so much? And I'm assuming this person means narcissist ex-girlfriend. <laughs> now she's an ex-narcissist. No, so wouldn't that be miss, cool, though? <laughs> uh, that would be, you know. So, um, yeah, so why does this person still miss his... Um, ex-girlfriend who's a narcissist so much. Okay. So the term that has been really helpful for us and for everybody, it's called cognitive dissonance. And that's used for when you're having two conflicting feelings about the same thing. And that's, I think the hardest part when you break up with a toxic person, we did a whole workshop on this. Actually, I think we did a couple about why it's so much harder to move on from a toxic relationship because of that cognitive dissonance. Um, so again, remember the phases of these types of relationships. And the first one is that love bombing or idealization phase where they make you feel like you are the most spectacular person in the world and you're their soulmate, that you're so important and you know, they've really built you up. And when you, when you end the relationship with someone who ha gives that to you, you know, there's a lot to miss. You feel like no one's ever going to love me as much. And they probably like in my situation acted like you were their best friend. So you feel a sense of tremendous loss with losing that part of relationship. And then on the other hand, you have the abuser that you also broke up with, the person that lied to you, probably cheated on you, made you feel terrible about yourself, um, probably made your life a living nightmare. And so it's you have the same person, the one who made you feel wonderful and made you feel awful. And so your brain sometimes has a tough time separating, separating out the good and bad. And you know it's a really, really common feeling to miss a toxic person. Sometimes it's like, it's like, than, it's go like ahead. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Right, right. And this is why I think cognitive dissonance is why it takes an average amount of seven to nine times to leave a toxic relationship because there's so many complex things involved with the personality that you're dealing with. And again, they are very, very manipulative. So, um, there, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot involved there. And the other big thing that makes it really hard to let go of a toxic person is the deep-seated belief that they can change. You want to believe that they can change. You want to believe that you have control over the situation. They'll make you feel as though you have control over a situation. If you were just a better partner, they wouldn't behave like this. And it's just so messed up. 
And that's what really destroys so many of us in these relationships. So it's tricky um, and it's a very, very common feeling to have. So once you realize what it is, you can try, try to start working through it and it might make things a little bit easier, but realize most people feel this way. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you hit it right on the head. They can, they're so good. You know, they've been practicing manipulation since, you know, usually they're, um, you know, since young adulthood or, or even before that. And um, they can be incredibly charming, even like intoxicating when you first meet them. Um, and they're really great at roping you in. And, and you know, I, I remember thinking, you know, um, after, um, you know, after everything blew up I, or, or even when we were in, you know, we were in trouble for like a lot of trouble for a couple of years towards the end. Um, I remember looking back and saying, why can't I go back to the good old days? And I tried to peg like when it changed. And the, the more time that went on, the more I was like, you know, there really that weren't that many good old days. Like it turned pretty early, you know, in, in the relationship. It was really maybe like the the first week was good, <laughs> you know, what I mean? it was, it wasn't nearly, uh, there were, there were red flags that I missed all over the place. We all do that. Um, but one thing that I found really helpful um, <clears throat> was when I first learned about narcissism, I talk about this all the time, um, <coughs> in the, it, it, like in the months after we separated, um, I, I, at one point, I learned about narcissism. I figured out, oh my gosh, there's an explanation for all this. And I learned about how narcissists can't feel love in the sense that a, a healthy, an emotionally healthy person can. Um, and I realized like it wasn't real. Like it was never love like I envision love. And for some reason, I found that very liberating. I was like, oh, there's, there's, there's kind of like nothing to mourn here. And it helped me get over it a lot faster, um, which I, I haven't really heard a lot of people say that. So maybe I'm unusual in that way, but um, I kind of helped that it was all a mirage. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Chris, I'm thinking we're already over half an hour at this point and we still have a couple more questions, but maybe we should save those for next week. Sounds good to me because I'm losing my voice too. Okay. Because of the COVID. All right. So I know there was a question that we said we would try to answer today, but we will get to it next time for sure. We're all ready. We have our thoughts together on it, but we got to let Chris rest and get over his COVID. Yeah. Hopefully by next, uh, next Thursday, you know, we'll be on at noon again and uh, hopefully I'll be back to uh, back to fighting shape by then, you know, hundred percent. Hopefully my gosh, this has been brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So all right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for coming and we will see you again next week.